Good morning. The service you are about to see, uh, the first Sunday in Lent for 2022, uh, was recorded prior to the invasion of Ukraine, which is why it includes no mention of it. So before inviting you to begin with us this Lenten journey and, and start this first installment of our Lenten series, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge um, the hurt and the horror all of us have felt as we have witnessed a, a free country invaded by a neighboring oligarch. Uh, you've seen the film footage, and it's heartbreaking, uh, the footage of people bravely trying to defend their homes and their homeland. Uh, over a, millions, a million have already uh, become refugees in neighboring countries, especially Poland, trying to escape the savage onslaught. I am thankful to God that virtually all the nations of the free world that honor democracy have come together to condemn this uh, evil and illegal attack by Vladimir Putin. I am grateful that the global community is standing up for morality, for that which is right and ethical. Uh, we are uh, entering today a season when we remember the sacrifice of one called the Suffering Servant, who set out toward Jerusalem to face a cross. But before the service begins, I would like for us to spend a moment in prayer for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine who are on their own journey of suffering and who, at this moment at least, are carrying heavy crosses. Uh, would you join with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, Friend of all people, you who did experience suffering at Golgotha, we pray to you on behalf of the people of Ukraine. Be near to them in their suffering. Grant them the power of your presence. May the pressure of governments around the world come to bear on those who would wage war. May the movement of your Holy Spirit change hearts and minds, and may peace be restored so that innocent people can live in their homeland with faith and without fear. O oh, Prince of Peace, may your love prevail. We ask in your holy name, amen. And now, worship with us. Welcome to Blowing Rock Methodist Church. How good it is always to have you here with us. As we begin the season of Lent, uh, you're wearing purple? Tis the season. I went back and got my purple tie, which hasn't been that long since we were wearing purple in Advent. And here we are beginning this journey toward the cross and ultimately toward the resurrection. So welcome aboard with us at Blowing Rock Methodist. Wherever you are across the country today, we're glad you're in Blowing Rock. We're so glad you're part of us. And keep telling our story. Tell other people they can find us here on this website. Uh, from October through May, we're here every Sunday. Um, and then, well, 52 weeks a year, we're here every Sunday. But but June through September, we're live with uh uh, the congregation, the choir, and the full service. But we're here every Sunday, so tell your friends how they can find us. Let's start with a prayer, please. We thank you, God, for this time together. We thank you for this season, this sacred, holy journey, uh, this time of contemplating what it means to be followers of one who bore a cross. Be with us in these moments today that we might sense your nearness, hear your word, and respond as your disciples. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to um, 
mention, as I do every week, how grateful I am to you for uh, your generous and gracious support of our ministry, which continues 12 months a year. Uh, the needs in the high country do not cease to exist uh, when we are away. As a matter of fact, sometimes they are even more intense given uh, situations with weather and schooling and housing and food. Uh, and there you are helping them. There you are feeding people. There you are providing medication to people that they otherwise couldn't get. There you are providing shelter in the cold for families and children when who knows what they would do or what they would face without you. There you are sending tutors into elementary schools. There you are helping out at residential communities for children and youth. You are there for them, reminding them that Christ is there with them through you. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity. It means the world to somebody. In fact, to a lot of somebodies. You can be givers to this ministry by finding the donate icon here on the website. It'll walk you through uh, whether you want to send a check in or use PayPal, however you choose to do it. We're just grateful that you are part of this team that seeks to do what Jesus called us to do in serving the world, oftentimes of people who cannot adequately serve themselves or their families. Thank you for that. Now I want to ask you to uh, center yourselves, focus with me, if you would, in a few moments of prayer. Let us pray together. O oh God of love, who calls us to make that our first priority, we enter today into a season where the real raw power of love cannot be denied. This is the season of Lent, the season of the cross, the season of the suffering servant who gave his life that we might find ours, the season of remembering his words the night before he died, greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends. During these weeks leading up to Easter, may we see, may we see what love looks like every time we look at Jesus. May we see the depth of love. May we see its willingness to put others first. May we see its unconditional nature given not just to those who are deserving, but to all of those who are in need, deserving or not. May we see its beauty reflected in the commitment of the one who set his face to go to Jerusalem on our behalf. During these weeks leading up to Easter, may we see. And during these weeks, may we also hear. May we hear Christ's voice asking us to do as he did. May we hear his words from the upper room, this is my commandment that you love. May we hear his calls to compassion and civility and kindness, whether or not it is easy and whether or not it is popular. May we hear the biblical truth that we were born simply and solely to love. And having seen his witness and having heard our own calling, May we respond by saying yes to love, which we know ultimately is saying yes to you and to the reason we were put here. This we pray in Jesus' name, remembering how he taught us when he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to uh, read to you a few verses from the Gospel of Luke, uh, the ninth chapter. Uh, these are verses that uh, set into motion the Lenten journey. 
This is the first step Jesus makes. So listen uh, to a few verses from ninth chapter, beginning verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others uh, one of the prophets of long ago who has come back to life. What about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you're God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their own cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever gives his life away for my sake will find it. When the days drew near for him to be received up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. As we begin the Lenten journey, O oh God, may we journey with Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Throughout the season of Lent, you and I are going to consider some passages just from the Gospel of Luke. All the Gospels have Lenten stories, but we're just going to walk through some of Luke's stories, uh, some things that Jesus said or did on the road to Jerusalem, that final journey he made to the holy city, or things he said or did or happened once he had arrived. And, um, you know, as the old saying goes, it's always good to begin at the beginning. And so that's what we're doing in the ninth chapter. Uh, it's amazing when you think about how much of the gospel of Luke is given just to the passion story, the Lenten story, and then the resurrection story. It starts in the ninth chapter and goes on for the rest of the gospel. The passage we just read uh, describes the moment when Jesus set out on his final journey to the holy city, and it says his face was set, or if you read from another version, uh, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Whichever wording you choose, it simply means this, he made an irreversible decision. Nobody could talk him out of it, and everybody knew there's no more point in trying. He is going to Jerusalem. My dad had a friend uh, named Red O'Quinn. Maybe one or two of you remember the name, but back in the day, it was a name people knew. Red O'Quinn was a star football player at Wake Forest. He went on to a great professional career. He was with the Chicago Bears, then with the Philadelphia Eagles, but his pinnacle came uh, in the Canadian Football League. He got a contract with the Montreal Alouettes, and he played up there for years and years, ultimately wound up in the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. Uh, he was an end. He was a magnificent receiver. Now, the Montreal Alouettes in the CFL back then were like uh, the Los Angeles Rams or the Kansas City Chiefs or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Green Bay Packers, or whomever it is that's so good in the NFL today. Montreal was at the top of the heap, and he was their star. They had a lot of stars. They had a lot of great players. Red O'Quinn told my dad, there were days in the locker room before we took the field when I knew we were going to win, we may be playing a really good team like Ottawa or Calgary or one of the others, but he said, I simply could look around the room and realize there is no one who can defeat us today. It's impossible for them to try. 
I could look around, he said, and see it in the eyes of my teammates, that steely determination. I could see it in their faces and how their jaws were set. And I knew before we took the field where we were going and what we were going to do, and the victory would be ours. What Red O'Quinn said about his teammates in Montreal is pretty much what Luke said about Jesus. His face was set. People had tried to talk him out of going to Jerusalem. His disciples, his family had said, come back to Capernaum. Just lay low till the heat's off. Things are bubbling there. It's not a safe time at all. And Jesus knew that. He said, I know when I get there what will happen. I'll be betrayed. I'll be abused. I'll be crucified. I know that but I know what my mission is, and I know the victory that awaits at the end of it. And he set his face, and ultimately his teammates knew there's no turning back. We cannot talk him out of this one. Well, let me mention three things that come to us from Luke's account in his ninth chapter. And the first is this, um, that Jesus bought into, he owned, subscribed to the Old Testament messianic understanding called suffering servant. Uh, Old Testament Jews had believed that when the Messiah comes, uh, he will possess the unlimited power of God himself. But, but, he will choose to pour that power out on behalf of others rather than to store that power up for himself. Uh, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed. That's what Jesus said to them when he began the Lenten journey. I know what's coming. I will be the servant who suffers for the sins of the world. It's what the Messiah does, and he set his face to do that. But then the second thing, he said to those disciples, uh, those who would follow me, whoever wants to be my disciple, uh, let them take up their own cross, and follow. In other words, he was saying to them, this suffering servant business, it applies to me. It also applies to anybody who would walk with me toward Jerusalem. Jesus said, the Christian journey is about service, Sometimes it's about sacrificial service. It's about giving and forgiving. It's about sometimes laying our lives on the line for that which matters. It's not about holding back. It's not about being measured in our commitment. It's not about saying, well, I'll do a little bit, but only so much. Jesus said, whoever would follow me, whoever would be my disciple, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and make the journey with me. Um, I read a report that came out not long ago, and I I don't mean to pick on anybody. I I really, truly don't. But I read a report that came out not long ago about uh, the the best paid uh, CEOs of not-for-profit agencies in America. And there was a list of the top 10 uh, and I actually knew a couple of them personally, but uh, um, there they were. Number one on the list was a minister, and not somebody I'd ever heard of before, not one of the, the ones that, you know, you turn on the TV and there he is, but was a minister, head of some mega church conglomerate ministry somewhere in America, 
and he makes seven million dollars a year. Seven million a year to be a pastor. I was never offered that church. <laughs> his wife, his wife is paid six hundred thousand a year for being the first lady. I, I told Paige about that, and she said, "I cannot imagine any minister on earth who is worth that kind of money." The first lady thing, on the other hand, <laughs> Jesus said, "Whoever would be my disciple, let them take up a cross and follow me. Let them sacrifice. Let them give. Let them be suffering servants, if need be. It doesn't mean that that we're called upon to be ascetics. That we're called upon to starve. That we're called upon to live lives of self denial. But it does mean that to follow Jesus implies not just implies but demands that we are passionate about the needs of the world, not just about our own. Needs. He told a story about that. You remember? He told a story about a man who had all kinds of stuff, and he needed bigger barns. He said, "Let's build bigger barns because I want more stuff." And he filled those up and said, "Now we need more barns to fill up with even more stuff." And Jesus said, "You fool! Your soul will be required of you. You're going to die. You can't carry any of it with you." The key is, what did you do with it while you had it? I was listening to an old Jack Benny radio program last week, and、uh, there was a moment where he was arguing with his insurance agent about why he was not allowed to list himself as the beneficiary on his own insurance policy. He was taking out a life insurance policy, and he wanted. To list himself as his beneficiary, he said, "It's mine. Why can't I take it with me?" Well, Jesus said, "That's not going to happen." And you and I, of course, know it isn't. So Jesus said, "The question is, what are we doing with it while we're here?" My predecessor at Marble Collegiate was a man named Arthur Caliandro, a saintly, wonderful human being. And Arthur used to say, "I'm convinced." That when we reach heaven's gates, we will be asked one question and only one. The question is, how well did you love? That's not inconsistent with what Jesus taught. If you would be my disciple, how well will you love? Will you sacrifice in your service? Will you give? And you folks do that so well. It's one of the reasons I'm always bragging about Blowing Rock Methodist. You do more than than anyone would even dare to dream with your generosity and supporting people who hurt and hunger and stumble in the darkness in the high country. And you are there for them with all those agencies. You use what God has given you to give back, which is what Jesus said to the disciples: If you would be my disciple, take up your cross. And become the kind of servant you see in me. Then there's this third thing. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. He made his decision. He didn't set the disciples' faces for them. He didn't make their decisions. His face was set. And then he said, "Now you have to decide for yourself." Whether or not you're going to make the journey to Jerusalem with me, I won't force it. You decide. I was teaching a lesson in class down at High Point earlier this semester about、uh, the Old Testament covenant, the Law of Moses, and I,、uh, I asked the students, "How many commandments are there?" Hands went up. The Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Yeah, I'm familiar with the Ten. Yeah, it's all Ten Commandments. And after a while, I said, "Okay, well, that's that's a good guess." But、uh, the fact is, 
In the Old Testament, there are 613 commandments. Now, they all fall somewhere within the framework of the top 10, but there are 613 ranging from something so big as thou shalt not kill, all the way to how you're supposed to wash your hands or your dinner plates for the meal. 613 commandments. Well, this young man in class, just a delightful kid, smart, funny. And he said, you know, I want to be faithful. And I know the commandments say, thou shalt this, thou shalt not that, thou shalt this, thou shalt not that. Ten of them are pretty tough, but I try to hang in there. But let me tell you, and it was one of those moments where you think, it's kind of like many a truth is said in jest. Ten of them I try to hang in there, he said, but let me tell you, over 600, that's just too much work. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I guess maybe some of the disciples would have felt that when Jesus said, I'm going to pick up a cross in Jerusalem, and they're going to nail me to it. I'm going to pour out my life in faithfulness to God and in love to people. I'm going to give everything I got. Now, if you want to be my disciple, you come with me, but I'm not going to force that on you. You get to choose. Jesus set his face. He let them decide what to do with their own. What he requires of us are things like sacrifice, suffering servant, service, suffering servant, kindness, civility, holding our tongues, holding somebody else's hand, holding somebody up when otherwise they would fall, giving, forgiving, loving, even people who don't seem to deserve it or who don't love us in return and never will. You listen to that, which is what cross-bearing means to a great extent. You listen to that, and it's easy to stand with that young man in class and say, I want to be faithful, but this is just too much work. So begins the Lenten story from the Gospel of Luke. And it's not easy, but then stories about marching toward a cross never are. The Lenten story is about a suffering servant who made an irreversible decision that he was going to do what was right, whether or not it was easy. Story about that same servant who asked those who would be his disciples to pick up their own cross and follow along. The story about someone who said, I've made my decision. He set his face. But you have the freedom to decide whether to go with me or to walk away. Next Sunday, we're going to take a look at a break Jesus took during his journey toward Jerusalem. Let us pray. O Christ, who suffered for our sins, who gave everything that we might live, empower us to take up our crosses of love and service and go where you lead. In your saving name we pray. Amen.